Merry Christmas, everybody. Tonight we're going to talk to you about an interesting extra canonical document that uh, has been recently translated called The Revelation of the Magi. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the Christmas story and, and how people were probably on drugs, probably. So uh, stay tuned for that. Hi everybody, Father Tony Sylvia here, and joining me as usual, my co-host Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. Merry Christmas, uh, listeners and people of Chelmsford. <laughs> yes, Merry Christmas to the people of Chelmsford. God bless us, everyone. And joining us this evening to discuss the revelation of the Magi is uh, Brett Landau from the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome, Brett. How are you? I'm doing great. It's good to be with both of you. Very, very good to have you on the show. So um, you are uh, working with a document called the Revelation of the Magi. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so this is the um, most detailed, um, most complex story about the Magi that survives in any of the early Christian Apocrypha. Uh, the Magi make uh, you know, fairly brief appearances in a number of apocryphal infancy gospels, but this is by far the most detailed story. Um, it's told from their perspective, so it's 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 a technically a pseudepigraphon, uh, so it's written as if the Magi themselves are writing it. And in this text, uh, the Magi are descendants of Adam and Eve's uh, third son, Seth. They are said to live in a land uh, that is at the uh, called Sheer, that's at the farthest east of the inhabited world, at the shore of the Great Ocean. Uh, Sheer, in some ancient uh, other ancient texts, was uh, roughly equivalent to China. So, basically, this is a text that says that the Magi are from China. They have been waiting for this prophecy that um, that Seth received from his father Adam that uh, there would be the appearance of a star one day that would signal the birth of God in human form and so they've been doing their rituals throughout the generations just waiting for this star to show up finally the star does show up in in the narrative and it descends to the mountain that the Magi are praying on and it transforms into a small, luminous human being uh, that the text makes clear is actually Christ himself. So Christ, in this text, uh, has the capability to transform from star form to human form. He's, he's polymorphous. Uh, and he takes the Magi on a journey to Bethlehem, and he's sort of reborn again, transforms from a star into a human being again uh, there, and he commissions the Magi to return to their own homeland and to, and to preach the gospel there. Uh, and when they go back, they have, um, the star has provided um, some food for them or, on their trip, or rather it's taken the food provisions that they brought with them and has multiplied it through uh, through the star's light. And when they return to their homeland of Sheer, they tell the people of the country, uh, you can experience the same things that we experienced. Take some of this food that the star produced for us and eat it. And the people do, and immediately they start seeing visions of the heavenly and earthly Jesus. They all convert to the faith that the Magi are proclaiming. Um, and then the text ends with a with a sort of an epilogue that I think was probably added at a uh, at a secondary point, so somewhat later, uh, where the apostle Thomas shows up and baptizes the Magi and commissions them to preach throughout the entire world. So it's an incredibly rich, uh, long story. Hmm. Yeah, and a very interesting tradition uh, in in biblical um, biblical history where. Uh, people f latch on to a character that's in w an older story, like uh, Enoch is a good example, how yeah. they, people latch on to Enoch and say, I want to know more about that guy, so they write more about that. And th that seems to be what's happening here. Yeah, um, uh, certainly to a certain, de uh, to, to some degree, that is, is an explanation for what's going on 
in the revelation of the Magi, one of the main uh, reasons that uh, Christians produced apocryphal literature was in some ways you can sort of think about some of this literature as fan fiction. It's taking things that uh, that they wish they knew more about and, you know, kind of telling stories about it. Uh, so it's it's definitely got that sort of, it, it fills this need for more information about people that early Christians were curious about. On the other hand, one of the things I've speculated in my own work on the Revelation of the Magi is that even though this is not written by the Magi themselves, it's not a, uh, it's not authentically uh, by the Magi, um, I do wonder if some of the religious experiences of the people who were responsible for this text are sort of embedded in the text, because on the one hand, their, their ritual that they practice every month is really, really elaborate. They immerse themselves in a sacred spring. They uh, ascend their sacred mountain over a period of, of several days. They pray in silence. They read cess books of Revelation. It seems like the text goes into a lot more detail than one would expect about you know something a, pro, a ritual practice that's just simply made up. Then there's also the episode of the um, the hallucinogenic star food, uh, which when I translated it for the first time, I thought I'd made a mistake because essentially what you had was people in the text eating food that then automatically produces um, visionary experiences of Jesus. It seems to me like there's, although I'm certainly open to other explanations for it, it seems like this could very well be a case of a reference to, to a hallucinogen that some early Christian group um, used ritually that's now embedded in this text. So yes, I would say that, uh, you know, there is the sort of fan fiction element of it, but I'm not sure that it's all to be understood that way. Mm -hmm written by a, a community as part of a living tradition to kind of give some uh, give some backstory to what they were already doing. Yeah, I think so, potentially, you know, to give some backstory, to give some legitimation, to, to say that, okay, we're, you know, we are operating out of the, you know, sort of spiritual lineage of the Magi themselves. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You, you, uh, you mentioned that, uh, the staying on this topic, that the uh, the magi uh, they pray silently, and that uh, that's actually where they get their name from, according to the text. It's it's related to their practice of, of praying silently. That doesn't sound very strange to our ears because I think most people often, particularly when they're by themselves, pray silently. But that was uh, that was odd at that time, or in in the context of the uh, of the uh, the text. Yeah, it's definitely distinctive. It's. Um... If we look at other um, pr prayer practices in the ancient world, most people are saying their prayers out loud. That's what's to be expected. Um, there are a few references here and there to silent prayer, but actually silent prayer was viewed with a fair amount of suspicion um, because it was sort of like, well, if, if you're praying and you're not saying what you're praying for, obviously you're praying for something bad to happen to somebody <laughs> or something like that. Um, you know, you're praying for something embarrassing. Um, you know, it's only sort of in the, in the, oh, I don't know, the period of Neoplatonism and early monasticism that you start to get sort of a valorization of silent prayer as this is a way to, you know, kind of um, commune with, with the divine. But, um, but it's definitely a distinctive practice. Um, yes, the, the text does say that etymologically the name Magi in their own language is somehow etymologically based on the word silence or prayer. I haven't been able to figure out that etymology. It doesn't make sense in, you know, Syriac, which is the language that the text is composed in, or Greek or Latin or anything like that. Um, I haven't gone, you know, farther afield to actually look at, say, Chinese languages, um, because I assume that the text wasn't actually written in China. Um, but maybe there's a connection there. Right. Speaking of that, where where does this text, uh, do you think, where does it come from? About when was it written? And what's its provenance? Yeah, so um, 
the in order to do the the provenance uh, of it, and and I sort of have to work backwards. And I talk about this in well, I guess a little product placement <laughs> Great, here. Yeah. Uh, uh, my book, which is available uh, on Amazon.com, it's uh, quite reasonably priced and makes an excellent Christmas gift. In in the book, I sort of work my way backwards and say, okay, we've got we've got one manuscript. It's from the eighth century. We've got a reference to the same story in a fifth century Latin commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, and those are the only really. Um, kind of manuscript or external attestations to it. So it's got to exist by the 5th century. The question is how much earlier than the 5th century it would have been. Mm -hmm. um, and there you have to sort of rely on on internal things in the text. One of the things that struck me is the fact that the Apostle Thomas shows up and yet in the Acts of Thomas, which you may have talked about on this show, the sure. Acts of Thomas, uh, uh, Thomas gets martyred in India. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no, there's no reference in any of the Acts of Thomas to him, you know, baptizing the Magi or encountering them or going on. So, it it could be an independent. This this could be sort of an independent Thomasine. Um, tradition about where Thomas did his missionary work. If that's the case, the Acts of Thomas is usually dated to the late 3rd, early 4th century, um, and that would sort of make me inclined to think that this text was roughly, you know, coterminous with that, uh, just because it doesn't seem to know the kind of dominant Thomas tradition of Thomas going to India. And if you look at other elements of the text, um, particularly the, the uh, business about Jesus uh, uh, having uh, polymorphic abilities, the ability to shape, shape shift, to transform from one, one form to another. You see that in a lot of second century and some third century texts. Mm -hmm. So I would say roughly that, you know, it's possible that the, the revelation of the Magi is late second century. I'm more comfortable with a third century date just because second century is pretty early for Syriac literature. Um, and in terms of at this fairly early stage in Syriac Christianity, um, you know, Edessa is a good guess. Edessa is one of the main centers of early Syriac speaking Christianity. It's not, not impossible that it would have been someplace else. Um, uh, uh, Adi Abene or, or someplace like that. Um, but Edessa is, is, is likely, and I think it's quite likely that Syriac was the original language of this. There are some plays on words in the text that really only seem to make sense uh, within a Syriac milieu. So mm -hmm. I would say third century Syriac. All right. That's that's the kind of geeky stuff we like on our show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we uh, wrap up and go to the podcast, I just want to, um, because I can't put the word drugs in the title and not really talk about it. Uh, so this hallucinogenic food uh, that the Magi eat and that they, they encourage the people back home to eat as well, um, this is... Uh, this isn't something you see in a lot of uh, Christian literature, be it canonical or otherwise. Um, mm. Where do you think this is coming from? Do you think this is an independent tradition that got folded into this version of Christianity, or? Mm. Yeah, it's 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 hard to say because there are certainly in early Christian literature there aren't a lot of other um, really compelling cases to be made for. Oh, this you know, this text has a veiled reference to a hallucinogenic practice or things like that. Certain things have been alleged to be that, mm -hmm. like like the celebration of the Eucharist or like other non-Christian um, rituals. But in terms of, and, and usually the evidence for them is not very good. It's pretty, uh, um, you know, pretty inferential. Mm -hmm. uh, but this text makes such a clear causal connection between the um, consumption of the food that the star provides and visionary experiences resulting from it that um, 
it's it, it seems like of of any of the alleged ancient references to hallucinogenic substances this actually seems to have the best chance i think of being actually uh real um so yeah that's that's what i would that's what i would say about it um it, it would be sort of shocking based on what we know about uh kind of religious traditions and hallucinogens and they're quite widespread throughout history so it would be surprising if no early christians uh ever you know kind of consumed some sort of hallucinogen mm -hmm. um much as some people would like to think that you know all <laughs> all the early christians were drug free um I, and I, one I uniform don't... monolithic faith that never changed and has always exactly. been the same yeah exactly <laughs> So yeah, I, I mean, I think I think it's quite reasonable. Um, I think sort of, and and I've written a paper that should hopefully be published oh, sometime next year, um, making the case for uh, there there being a, a a reference to hallucinogens in this text. I think one of the next steps that I'd like to investigate is just what were the hallucinogens that were theoretically available mm. in the uh you know in the ancient middle east um could it be mushrooms it's it's a little hard to to know in terms of identifying the specific substance how much um how much credence to put in the way that the text describes these things mm -hmm. because the what it says about them is that the magi took provisions um, basically food supplies. It doesn't specify any further what kind of food it was, but they took provisions with them on this trip. And while the star's light shine, uh, shone upon their food, uh, their food multiplied. That's essentially all the text tells us about whatever this substance is. Um, that makes you sort of think you know, something that multiplies food, something that like kind of grows upon food or something like that, that sounds a little bit like a fungus, mm -hmm. um, something like that. Or, um, you know, an ergot, which is this um, grain fungus, mm -hmm. has uh, sometimes been alleged to be behind um, uh, religious experiences or visionary experiences. It's, it's in fact been alleged that um, that's where the Salem uh, witch trials and the witch hysteria came from mm -hmm. was um, uh, ergot infested bread. Um, that ten ergot tends to make one violently ill, and there's not any reference to that in this text. Um, the fact that mushrooms, you know, anecdotally are said to grow at nighttime and to grow by moonlight or mm. grow by starlight, even though that's not really what's happening. Right. Uh, the fact that this text links their the production of this food to the light of a star is sort of suggestive and and in the paper that I've written I say I don't know that we can necessarily determine with any degree of certainty what the substance was but um, mushrooms are a are a decent option in the absence of more um, more specific evidence yeah Interesting. Well, let's wrap things up here for the video show and let's uh, move on to the podcast that um, everybody can catch next week. So we're kind of hitting uh, this one will, is uh, airing the week before Christmas and this one will air the week after kind of leading up to um, uh, Epiphany Sunday, which is uh, the day traditionally celebrated when the Magi came to uh, you know, visit uh, baby Jesus in the manger. So we're kind of spreading this out. So <laughs> stay tuned for the podcast uh, next week, and uh, and you'll catch some of that. Uh, in the meantime, Brent, where can people find you online? And you already uh, mentioned your book, Revelation of the Magi, which people should uh, pick up and read. But uh, where where can people find you and your work and all that? Stuff? Yeah. So um, basically, uh, my. Um you know, my web presence is, apart from a few discarded blogs, uh, I just have my uh, faculty website at uh, uh, University of, of Texas at Austin. So if you just Google Brent Landau Religious Studies UT Austin, you'll find, uh, you'll find my faculty page quite easily. My email address, if people want to uh, uh, get in touch with me, is bclandau at utexas.edu. Um, so, and the book is, uh, is available on Amazon. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us to uh, talk about this interesting text and uh, we'll have 
a lot more to talk about when we do the podcast uh, next. Uh, anyway, uh, I want to uh, also mention that the Apostolic Joanne Church is having its annual conclave May 12th through the 17th, I believe. I didn't write that down, but I'm, I'm almost positive that that's what's happening. So if you are interested in coming and hanging out with a bunch of uh, Gnostics and, and religious geeks and, uh, and some scholars and some interesting folks, uh, please do uh, come and visit with us in Salem, Massachusetts. Speaking of the Salem Witch Trials, May 12th through the 17th of uh, 2016. And uh, you can come for the whole week or you can come for the weekend. Visit joanite.org slash conclave2016 for more information about that. Uh, anyway, for, uh, for all of us here at Talk Gnosis, uh, for all of you watching along at home, we'll see you next week. Happy holidays. Happy Merry Christmas and whatever. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.